Hi, everybody. I'm Brittany Lewis with Forbes Breaking News. Joining me now is Dr. Harry Wilson, Professor Emeritus at Roanoke University. Dr. Wilson, thank you so much for joining me. Sure, my pleasure to be here. Roanoke College released a really interesting poll recently about Virginia voters. President Biden, former President Donald Trump are tied in a head-to-head -head matchup. Read the tea leaves here for us. What did you take away from this poll? I think the, uh, the, the big takeaway, I mean, everyone, and I understand, we always focus on the the horse race, it's tied or or whatever. And in in the head-to-head -head matchup, we did have them tied in a five-lane matchup because we were in the field prior to the Libertarians nominating a presidential candidate. So we had five, not six. Next time around, we'll have six folks on there. Pretty soon the list will get just like so long, we may not be able to read it. But um, but in, in the, that five-way matchup, uh, Biden was up by two, 40 to 38. But I think what's what's important about this is even though the results here are within the margin of error of the last two Roanoke College polls going back six months, um, where we had Biden plus four in both of those. So it's within the margin of error. But if you look at this over time, we can see that things seem to be moving in the direction of Trump. Um, that the Biden lead was larger, you know, a year ago when we were saying it was a theoretical matchup, and I think most people thought that was going to be the real one. Um, and it, it continues to sort of shrink. And now it seems to be down to virtually nothing. Why in Virginia particularly is this lead, is Biden's lead shrinking to the point where head-to-head -head matchup, they are tied, and then Biden is plus two from Trump when there are those third-party candidates? I think what, what, what we, we're seeing here is, I think a lot of people, if you look a little deeper in our results and, and, and break it up by party, I think there were a lot of people who, who were thinking that Trump was not going to do very well, for example, with the Haley voters or the, the never Trumpers within the Republican party. And, you know, our results show that more than 90% of Republicans say they're gonna vote for Trump, which is equal to what Biden has with the Democrats. So that sort of fall, fall off that people were thinking that was going to happen to Trump doesn't seem to have, does not seem to have happened. Or if they were in a different camp, they seem to have come back home already, which is early to come back home in the campaign season. But I think that's probably what's going on there. And clearly nationally, um, you know, the, the polls are tighter and, and more in favor of Trump than they were four years ago. But Virginia, it's this is a significant difference in Virginia. We're not the only poll that has it close. Uh, and, and if you recall, Biden won Virginia by 10 points four years ago. And polling, and dare I say, even the Roanoke College poll had him up by a little bit more than that. Nobody ever wants to say they were wrong, but we have Biden by a little bit more than 10, not a lot more, but a little more than 10. Um, and, you know, this time around, it doesn't look like that's going to happen. I want to talk about Biden's approval rating, which right now, according to the Romano College poll, sits at 35 percent amongst Virginians. Historically, what does this mean for Biden? Like, is this low at the, for a president at this point in his presidency when he's running for re-election? This is low. Yes. I mean, this is this is low. Again, doing just doing national comparisons, uh, Biden's approval rating is very low. Um, but four years ago, Trump's approval rating, I, I can't do it off the top of my head, but he's not breaking any records for, for being for high approval ratings four years ago either. Um, so it's it, it, but it is low. Uh, now, what I can say is, if you if you showed me someone that was this far underwater, and if you look at his favorable, unfavorable, I um, think again off the top of my head, it was thirty six percent favorable and fifty eight unfavorable. I could be off by one each direction there, but something like that. Um, if you show me that candidate, I would say this person must be behind by fifteen points because this is a pretty unpopular individual. But again, if we look at favorable, unfavorable, um, Trump was identical to Biden and favorable, and Biden's unfavorables were 1% more than Trump's, which, you know, in polling is nothing, literally nothing. So I would say they're, they're viewed equally unfavorably. Uh, but yeah, if you're running for president, you do not want to see those numbers. 
like you said, Donald Trump, when he was in office, was by no means a popular president when it comes to his approval ratings. But this poll found that Virginia voters are looking at the Trump years more favorably than they are currently at the Biden years. What do you make of that? I think that's a really important finding. And kudos to you for, for digging into that. Um, I think that really is important because it's not surprising that we see Republicans overwhelmingly remembering the Trump years as mostly good for the country and the Biden years not so much. Um, that was almost 90 percent, again, of Republicans. But fi only 50 percent of Democrats now think of the Biden years as mostly good for the country. And and that, I think, could be a, a really bad omen for Biden, that his own team, we would expect Republicans to say the Biden years are not very good. And we'd expect Democrats to say the Trump years are not very good because Republicans and Democrats can't agree today on what color the sky is. Um, so that would be sort of a given. But when I saw only 50 percent of the Democrats saying the Biden years were mostly good for the country, my first thought was, again, and I'm not part of either campaign, but I was thinking, man, if I was working for the Biden campaign, I would look at that number and I would simply say, we have a problem. This is not good. We should be higher. We should be higher than that. I don't know. I don't know exactly where you should be, but I can assure you among your own partisans, you should be higher than 50 percent. That's not a good place to be. A constant theme when you're talking about politics, especially this election cycle, is that it's unprecedented, but it is a sequel of something we saw before in 2020. But now this time we have all witnessed a Trump presidency as well as a Biden presidency. So these candidates are not new. Uh, the poll found that 64% of likely voters are very certain of who they will vote for, and 28% are somewhat certain of who they're going to vote for. Do you think that this means the election is going to come down to turnout or persuading these undecideds, perhaps the independents, hey, vote for my guy over the other? Um, I think, yeah, those, those are really key points. And I was frankly a little surprised when I saw those enthusiasm numbers uh, because everything we're reading is that people are not excited about this election. Um, and our, our favorable, unfavorable ratings would, would sort of confirm that. But um, I think, yeah, we did see people who were enthusiastic about voting. We saw people who were pretty certain about their vote as well. And, and both of those were sort of in some ways surprising, but the partisans not surprising to me because they're just not going to change regardless. Um, but yeah, I think what it comes down to is going to be those independent voters. We had only 2% undecided which I don't know in 30 years of, of working for the Roanoke College poll, I don't know that I've ever seen only 2% undecided ever in a poll. Maybe one week before the election, maybe one week before the election. Four and a half months before the election is something I have just never seen. Normally now we'd be seeing 15% ballpark. Um, and yeah, the big question is going to be, I think, what happens with those independent voters? In that five-way matchup, we had 8% going for Kennedy, and I think Stein was 3%, and West was 1%. Uh, and again, we didn't have the Libertarian because at the time they didn't have a presidential candidate yet. The question, the big question is going to be what's going to happen with those folks, because I think the Republicans are going to stay with Trump, the Democrats are going to stay with Biden, and what happens to these people? Do they actually vote third party? Do they go to one of the two major party candidates? Or in some cases, do they simply decide to sit it out and they simply decide not to vote? And, and that, I think, is where we're going to see any changes between now and November. That's where I would expect to see those changes and see what's happening there. Obviously, in politics, five months between now and Election Day really is a lifetime and so much can happen. But what do you think are the issues that can propel those types of voters one way or another? Um, that's a really good question, which is academic speak for, I don't really know the answer. Um, but it's, it, it is because it's, it's difficult sometimes to know those voters often tend to be not always, but often tend to be lower interest voters, sometimes lower information voters, and sometimes occasional voters. And for those folks, it's, it's difficult to know. Although certainly in our in our poll, the economy was noted as the most important issue by far. 
Uh, and again, something that does not bode well for Joe Biden, since we did not ask it in our poll, but every other poll I've read, voters are saying Trump would be better on the economy than Biden. So again, if I'm seeing that's that's a plurality of, of voters saying that's the most important issue. Again, if I'm the Biden campaign, I'm thinking this is not good for us. Let's talk about the economy because this poll, among many other national polls, found that the economy is the top issue. But there have been some good signs for the economy. Just this month, we have seen records in the S&P 500 as well as the NASDAQ. April CPI report showed that inflation is cooling off. Do you think that this is good news for Biden or people simply can't feel it because their wallets are still hurting, grocery prices are still high? Um, I think I think the latter. Um, and and I can go way back in way back in contemporary American history. Uh, for a lot of viewers aren't going to go this far back. But uh, in 1992, way back when, we had we were coming out of a recession. We were out of the recession. The recession had, in fact, ended. And George H.W. Bush was running for re-election and trying to convince people things are getting better. Things are, in fact, better. The recession is over. Voters didn't buy it. Right. Hence Bill Clinton and it's the economy, stupid. Right. Um, voters didn't buy it. And I think that's what we're seeing this time from I'm not an economist. I do have economist friends, but I'm not an economist. But um, I, I think what we're seeing here really is a cumulative effect. And I've read that I'm not the person to come up with that. I've read this in several different places that is sort of not just that, that yes, inflation now has is cooled off undoubtedly. Right. And every every measure, which I don't question, is is saying that. But I think what a lot of people look at is, you know, when they go to the grocery store, and I can speak to this personally, since I do most of the grocery shopping in my family, uh, I'm paying a lot more for goods than I was three or four or five years ago. And that's, that's just, a sentiment many that's just Americans a given. have. Every, yeah. every, uh, every voter I've talked to from Iowa to Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, everywhere in between, People are saying my dollar does not go as far today as it did before. So do you think that this election is going to come down to the economy? Um, I think that's going to be an important issue. I mean, a lot of it depends on what happens in the next five months. And I know the Democrats in the, in the Biden campaign were hoping for the Fed to cut rates. And that may or apparently now may not, probably may not, whatever happened before the election, or if it does just before, um, but a lot of those, again, I know economic models that predict elections have generally looked at the economy, things like six to eight months out from the election, prior to the election, not six to eight weeks, but six to eight months. And if that's the case, again, I think that that doesn't look very good um, for the Biden campaign, and as they can somehow sort of take the attention off of that. And it isn't that the numbers are not improving, because, I mean, as you noted, the numbers are in fact improving, but people have to feel that and they have to sense that things are really getting better. Um, and we don't know, I mean, consumer, again, consumer sentiment, we just did it, we do that in the Roanoke College poll, consumer sentiment in Virginia was down the same as it is nationally. Um, so those things again are, are suggesting that for voters, they're thinking the economy is still not doing very well. I want to talk about another event that will take place between now and Election Day. The jury in Donald Trump's New York hush money trial is currently in deliberations. Based on your poll, based on talking to voters in Virginia, do Virginian voters care about whether he's convicted or not? And if so, is this a non-starter? Is this a deal breaker? What does that look like? We Honestly, we did not ask that question. Um, we'll certainly be when we go back into the field again in August, we'll be we'll be seeing where that is. My estimate, my guess at this point, is it's probably not going to make a big difference. Um, and and I think part of that is because, from my pers my perspective, and again, this is speculation on my part, that for both of these candidates, pretty much everything is baked in. I don't know that anyone was really shocked by the revelations in that trial in New York. 
about what Trump allegedly did and, and he denies. But I don't know that anyone was surprised and thought, oh my goodness, I can't believe someone saying he did, did this. I think it's more likely that people are saying, well, yeah, like we kind of knew that. Um, and my guess, again, this is a guess, is that the outcome of this is like everything else is going to be seen through two different lenses. Either justice was done or it was a huge injustice, depending on a guilty or a non-guilty verdict, who's on which side. But I think that's what we're going to see. And I think for, for both of these candidates, something I, I mentioned earlier, that I don't know that else we'll see a lot of change over the next several months among the partisans is because, as you mentioned, we know both of these candidates. They've both, one is president, the other one was president. We kind of know, at least in our heads, or we think we know their characters, whether we like their characters or not. We know their characters. We kind of know their policies, whether we like those policies or not. And again, the question sort of did ask, we can do an overall summary of, do we think those were generally good years or do we think those were generally not so good years? And I don't think those evaluations, you know, are going to change uh, unless one campaign or the other can really dramatically change the narrative. And that I think is that I think is really difficult to do. If you're an unknown candidate, you've got an, you've got some ability to define yourself. You've got some ability to potentially redefine what the election's about. For both of these candidates, I don't think they really have that ability. Um, you know, this this thing is sort of taken on a life of its own. And again, going back to the two percent undecided, there not don't seem to be a lot of people sitting on the fence there saying, "Oh, gee, I'm not sure what I want to do here." Uh, and people seem to have a pretty good idea of of what they want to do. And to your point about people, this won't change people's minds when it comes to the New York trial. I mean. The names Donald Trump, Stormy Daniels, Michael Cohen, these are all names that Americans have heard and have heard and been talking about for years. So going back to the Roanoke College poll, is there anything else in there that stuck out to you that you're looking at as we sit here five months from Election Day? I think one thing that was that was really interesting, and I don't know the, the impact it's going to have on the election, but we did ask... Um, all voters about um, the 2020 election and the 2016 election. If we thought that in 2020, if Joe Biden was elected legitimately, or if he won because of election irregularities, 2016, we asked, did Trump win legitimately or did he win because he colluded with Russians? And again, this is indicative of the partisan differences we have. Uh, we had 60%, 67% of Republicans said Biden won because of election irregularities, okay? 29% said he legitimately won. For Democrats, right, 53% said Trump won legitimately, but 41% said he won because he colluded with Russia. What this says to me is, again, we've got partisans, essentially, as I described it in the, in the press release I wrote, essentially from different planets, um, and I didn't use Mars and Venus because they, those are too close. I used Mercury and Pluto because they're about as far away as you can get from one another. Um, and that's what it is. We, we've got a um, situation here where everything is viewed through that partisan lens and everything gets defined that way. It gets interpreted that way. It gets defined that way. And when we can't even agree on did someone legitimately win an election? Um, and I mean, this is a question, again, I've been polling for 30 years. I've never even thought to ask this question before. It just, it, it was, it would like never have occurred to me. Like I, I need to ask questions about, do people think that the last two presidents, the current president and the previous one were legitimately elected? Um, maybe back in 2000, after the 2000 election, we might've asked that, but otherwise, it would have been, I mean, just unheard of. Um, and, and I think that is in itself speaks volumes about a lot of different things that I even thought that we should ask this question or ask those two questions. Going to your astronomy comparison there, right now you think the partisans 
Mercury and Pluto, do you ever think there's going to be a time where we even get to Mars and Venus again, where at least we're closer together? It would be, I mean, I don't know, putting on my 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 citizen cap now and taking off the pollster and political science cap. I, I would like to see that. Um, yeah, you know, I was just reading an article this morning about how the U.S. Senate used to be much more productive. And the argument was because... 40, 50 years ago, so many of the members of the U.S. Senate, and they were virtually all white males, by the way, but so many members of the U.S. Senate on both sides of the aisle were World War II veterans. And the argument was this was bonding experience, shared experience that they had, and that they learned from that they could work with other people. And, and they could, when they got to the Senate, they could cross party lines at least sometimes and that would be okay. Um, in 2024, it seems like it's never permissible to cross party lines in the Senate or the House. And if you do, you're a rhino or whatever we call Democrats who occasionally defect from the Democratic Party line. Um, do we call them <clears throat> dinos or dinos? I don't know. But whatever we call them, there aren't many, you know, there just aren't many of them in Congress anymore. And there just aren't many there aren't many centrists, right? I mean, you know, there aren't many Joe, Joe Manchins and pretty soon there won't be one Joe Manchin. Um, so it's it's difficult to see how, how that happens unless that actually becomes sort of a grassroots movement. And I'm not sure I see that either. It's kind of a pessimistic view, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to find a silver lining there. But I mean, one thing I can say is silver lining. I think if you put, I think if you put people together in a room, which we can't do 310 million people. But if you put people together in a room, I think people can find solutions and people can do that in a civilized manner. Uh, I know at Roanoke College a couple of years ago, a couple of my colleagues were trying to organize and did organize a I guess, civil discourse club, essentially, where students could get together and the rule was, this is civil discourse. We can disagree on the issues and we can disagree on everything, but the rule is essentially no name calling and we're going to be we're going to be civil. But again, if we look at politics today, which is a lot of finger pointing and an awful lot of name calling, again, if you go back and I know this is somebody saying, oh yeah, the good old days, blah, blah, blah. But, um, you know, there was some de decorum in Congress. Not always, I know, go back to post-Civil War, pre-Civil War, and we've got people pounding each other on the head with a cane, which is hardly civil discourse. But um, but for the most part, there was some civil discourse going on there. And today we've got a lot more name calling. And, and that seems to go back and forth. And, and I don't know how, you know, I don't know how we, we saw that. But I do think if you put people together, uh, you know, if you go out there and, and, and talk to people in your everyday life, and I apologize for rambling on here, but if you go out and talk to people in, in your day-to-day -day life, mm -hmm. the people that I see, we don't talk about politics all the time. We talk about our lives. We talk about what's going on in, in the community. We talk about things like that. Um, and, you know, most of the time, nobody asks anybody, are you a Republican or are you a Democrat? And I have to live in a in a, actually in a purple county, um, really pretty purple. And um, it, it, it just doesn't seem for the most part to matter. Um, that, that most people I think are simply just trying to go about their lives and their lives, I think it's a good thing, don't perpetually revolve around politics. Um, even if they recognize politics is important, but that's not the central focus of their lives. And now, like I said earlier, as we sit here five months from Election Day, we have direct comparisons to Biden's presidency. We can look at the past four years and then look at 2016 to 2020, well, 2017 to 20, beginning of 2021 for President Trump. And I am curious, what are you looking for between now and Election Day? I think what I'm really looking for is to see what happens Again, go circling back to the conversation we had a few minutes ago with those independents. Um, I mean, certainly we, we will look to see if 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 Trump is found guilty 
if there's a fall off in Republican support for him. There can't be a fall off in Democratic support because it's essentially almost non-existent. Um, and, and by the same token, I don't see any way if he's found not guilty that that some Biden supporter is going to say, oh, geez, well, I guess he's really a good guy. So now I can go vote for him. That's no one's going to do that calculus in their head, you know, or, or you know, maybe one person in the country will do that. Not one percent, one person in the country will do that. Um, you know, so th that I think we're, you know, we're just not going to see a lot there. I think what we need to look for is something you mentioned at the outset of this interview, turnout is always critical and um, turnout and the independence and looking at, at the bigger picture, I think um, putting Virginia in this context, um, I've been around Virginia long enough that I tell people when I moved to Virginia, Virginia was blue trending red then it turned red then it was red trending blue then it turned blue and now maybe it's blue trending red again or maybe i'm just a really old guy and have been around for a really long time to see all this i don't know that's going back several decades but things move in things move in cycles and i'm not sure if this is what we're seeing or not but again, putting the, putting Virginia in the context of the bigger picture, um, if I was the Biden campaign again, I would be concerned about this because if Virginia is in play, from my perspective, they have problems. If you have a state that you won by 10 points four years ago and it's even in play this time around, that's not looking that's not looking good for you, even if you hold on. That's not a that's not a positive sign. And from the, the Trump campaign, somebody, I guess, has to decide, you know, do we actually try to contest this state, which four years ago, they didn't do very much. Uh, I mean, I remember, again, when Virginia was one of those swing states, and it was just, I mean, for four months, you didn't even want to turn on the television, because you were simply going to be verbally assaulted nonstop for four months. And... You know, everybody was happy when the election was over, whether they won or lost, because it was over. And we can go back to seeing TVs or televisions being advertised and cars being advertised and insurance companies and things like that and get away from politics. Um, but it, it, it is, I think, really important to Virginia again. And our poll is not the only one that has it close if Virginia is back in play again. Um, and it'd be interesting to see. <clears throat> excuse me, to see how that plays out with both of the campaigns. And Virginia has voted for a Democrat for president since 2008. So do you think Virginia is very much in play again? I think it could be. Um, I mean, again, we have to look and, and, you know, obviously the campaigns have their internal polls and I have no um, crystal ball, nor do I have any insight into their internals. So I don't know, but I know we're not the only external poll in Virginia and um, there aren't as many as there used to be because when Virginia was considered to be a swing state, everybody was polling in Virginia. And then when it's not, um, the big boys, as I refer to them, sometimes pull out, understandably, because they're going to Arizona, they're going to Michigan, you know, they're going to North Carolina, they're going someplace else. Um, but if Virginia is back in play, that, that I think is, is an important event in this campaign and important for both campaigns and important for the country um, that, you know, what that says, I don't know. It could be, it could be a shift. You know, you say, well, you know, again, Virginia elected a Republican governor three years ago, but that's not, I was, I was surprised that he beat Terry McAuliffe. Frankly, I didn't think when, when I heard that matchup, I was thinking this is not much of a matchup, no insult to governor Yunkin, but McCall was a relatively popular governor. I was polling when he was governor. He was relatively popular. And um, I thought, you know, you've got an, a popular former governor running against someone with much lower name recognition. At the outset, I was thinking this is not going to be much of a contest. And it turns out, obviously, Youngkin won. Some of that, I think, was a reaction to President Biden and the Democrats holding the White House, which Virginia has a mini history of doing that if the Republicans take the White House the next year, 
Virginia elects a Democratic governor. If Democrats take the White House the next year, Virginia can elect a Republican governor. So Virginia will sometimes do that. And for your viewers, Virginia has um, governors are limited to one term. So no one can run for, run for re-election. They're all one term. Um, but you can run, as McAuliffe did, if you take off four years, you can come back. Um, but you can't run consecutive terms. So um, there's a history of that. But if you look at the Youngkin election again, and he's pretty popular. Uh, we saw that in, in the Rhode Island College poll that we're talking about here. Um, more popular than anybody else, which may be a low bar, but he was more popular than the other guys. Um, but um, maybe, maybe you know, Virginia is trending back again. It's, you know, politics runs in cycles. Um, I think people often don't think that. They think, well, some one party's in power and they're always going to be in power. And I've been around long enough now to see that's just not the way it works. They may be in power for a while, but eventually that pendulum is going to swing back and the other guys are going to come back into power. I'm not sure if this is, you know, I'm not sure if this is it or not, certainly way too early to say, but I, I would not rule it out. Well, Dr. Wilson, thank you for your insights. We will leave it there. We will keep our eye on Virginia. And as we do, I hope you come back on and join me.